All right. We're here today with Mr. Martin Newell. How you doing, Martin? Hello, everyone in podcast land. <laughs> yes, I'm tired, actually, I, uh, because I, all I've been doing is recording and recording and writing and recording because um, that's kind of what I do. It's like a hedgehog goes burrowing or something like that or foraging for stuff. I go recording now. I just record. I mean, lockdown, you know, hasn't really been too much hardship. I've written stuff and I've and I've recorded stuff and then I've recorded more stuff and written stuff. When I got sick of that, I've just written stuff. And suddenly a year's gone by <laughs> and I've had a book out <laughs> and made yes. all these tracks and got about 28 tracks of which we will pick 14 for the new album, which is as yet untitled. But there is much coming up, you know. Yeah. Rock and roll yeah. hedgehog. Yeah. There is much coming up soon. I think in this, in this next, uh, I mean, it was all going a bit bonkers before lockdown, really. You know, we had a film premiere. Yes. In the West End of London. And then they showed it in New York at that place at UC, what is it, University of New York. NYU, yeah, I was there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, what, you were in New York at the time? I, I was uh, in Connecticut about an hour and a half outside, so I went, took the train in. Right. Uh, yeah, because they, they showed me pictures of the audience, which was great. And... Uh, I couldn't believe it, really, because I'd been in the West End of, you know, done a pre when Graham, the filmmaker, this is the film um, Upstairs Planet. And he said, oh, would you come along to the London premiere? I'm thinking, oh, what would it be to be some, the Ritz, or it'd be somewhere, you know, out of, you know, out of town, not, you know, or off Broadway, as you call it, in, in America. And, or, and it was right in the centre of the West End in London's oldest most prestigious cinema. I mean, it wasn't the Leicester Square Odeon, but you know, it was much nicer. It was it was, it was the, the film, first moving cinema in London, which had shown in 1896, the Lumiere Brothers uh, Cinematographe or Cinematographique, whatever it was, complete with the machine and everything which it housed. And then it ran as a cinema for many, many years until something like the the 1980s and it took a break but they never they kept the they turned it into a lecture theater but they kept the integrity of the cinema so when 30 years later they decided to restore this cinema all the carvings and its basic grandeur were still there so you've got this very lovely little antique cinema which was which was actually a theater built in 1860 before that in Regent Street in the heart of London. You can see the BBC from there if you stand outside the door and you don't even need a telescope or anything. And and uh, I couldn't believe this stuff. you know what am I doing here to Graham and he said oh we, you know they liked the idea of the film. We got this film that's very very DIY looking. It's the DIY film it's about a DIY guy. And we're in the West End and, you know, I had people around here saying, oh, Martin, how's your, your little film going? And I was saying, oh, well, we've got to show it tonight. So, oh, what a premiere is it? Will you be showing it somewhere in Colchester? I said, no, we're in London. Oh, I see. Where's that? I said, well, well, we're in the West End. We've got a West End premiere. I said, well, where's it going after that? I said, well, I thought it was going to Berlin, but apparently um, it's going to New York next, I found. And I said, really? We're, we're in New York, Brooklyn or somewhere like that. I said, um, it's on Broadway somewhere and yeah. people are like clang. <laughs> I fucking loved it. <laughs> you know, they just look at me. You can smell the burning circuitry as they look at me. <laughs> now, there's two documentaries, right? Or there was another one in the works as well. Oh, there's more than that. It's, it's like you wait all your life for a film to come along, and four come along at once, like buses, like London buses, you know, they all come around the corner at once. What happened next is that the film which we were originally going to be shown by James Sharp, who's a, you know, a really good director, but he's, he's, he's more, more conventional, I suppose, than Graham. I lost your audio. Okay, yeah, we've got this film called the The Jangling Man. Yes, and that's the next one, and that's I think it's about ninety minutes, but it's become a bit more. It was going to be a twenty-minute quick documentary for Captured Tracks to use for the Greatest Human Englishman back in twenty eighteen, 
Uh, then 2018 came and went, and 2019 was just coming and going. And we were all set to go for 2020, and guess what happened? So now, three years later, and I, I know films take even longer than, than Eagles albums, or Tears for Fears even, you know, three months on the snare drum, that's a legend. But, um, you know, the time's just passed. It. It was, it was, I'd have been much more impatient if I was younger, but time goes quick, quickly when you're older which is a drag, but, um, it, you know, suddenly we, th we thought they were going to get it out on the 26th of March, but both the directors, the American guy uh, and, and James, that's Jim and, and, uh, and James here, got COVID. Ooh. James right. got it because his mother works as a nurse or something like that um, here, and he recovered from it pretty quickly. He's, he's back from it. But um, Jim is taking a little bit longer. He, he's, he's OK. He's going to be all right, but he needs to rest. We're, so we're, in filmmakers' words, a few, a few days behind, which in everyone else's world is, I don't know, probably be ready by about 26, I don't know, 2060 or something. I, no, they, they think it will be ready quite soon. It's got to be because it's supposed to accompany the release of the Off-White album, which, which is out on the 26th of March. Quite apart from that, though, there is a director in this country called Michael Cumming, who back in 20, oh, let me get this right, 2003, when I was 50, I, having not done any gigs for years because I'd been a writer, or I'd not done any music gigs, I decided to do a thing called The Golden Afternoon. Mm. The first ever Golden Afternoon. He came along with a crew and also had a camera from a director I knew here and filmed this thing with multiple cameras. And a couple of bits got posted up on YouTube uh, and it kind of got forgotten about. And then suddenly he discovered it. And during lockdown, as so many directors and writers and other people thought, I know what I'll do. I'll tidy up my cupboard. <laughs> he found this, did a beautiful job of it. And it's about, I don't know, an hour, an hour and 15 of me with Nell and, and, and uh, Graham doing a kind of best of up till then, you know, Miss Van Houten's coffee shop, bits and pieces of this and that, bits and pieces of radio automatic. Uh, it was a, it was a long, long, a live, beautifully filmed one June afternoon at Colchester Art Centre, which is my favourite gig. I didn't think I'd ever see it, but it's done. Wow. It's ready. And it's, and, it, and we're, we're waiting because there's now this queue up of films. It's only etiquette because James has been, <laughs> his film so we can't we can't go until until we've until captured tracks of saying this thing and not there's been a lot of interest in the jangling man and uh the stories are various but there's stories of a of, of a well-known company that does films you know on on the network pictures on the network you know that sort of thing mm. there it, there's there's talk about them there's also a cinema chain. And of course, that, that's before we even go to the DVD or anything else. So that's quite exciting because they've got a lot of people in it. They've got, you know, they've got Mac DeMarco. And have you seen a trailer for it? I haven't, no. They've got Mac DeMarco and Stevie Moore and quite a lot of people, you know, because, you know, the claims from Venus have become this, this kind of thing, apparently. Especially in America, yeah. All, all, these are all people who've covered your stuff. Right? Yeah, yeah, and and not only that, but people who've claimed to have been or finally admitted to being influenced by me. But I mean, I don't mind. I'm not coming out to you know whoop anybody's ass or whatever you Americans do to each other when you're cross. And anyway, I'm not cross. <laughs> I'm jolly pleased. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, White Reaper were my big discovery of last year. I they were brilliant. They're fantastic. Yeah. I love that band. They do, they do an album called uh, Judy, a song called Judy French. Mm. Have you heard that? Yeah, it's excellent. It's a, such a great song, and the and that's the kind of band that if I was young, and they wanted a singer, that's the kind of band I think. Yeah, that's the kind of band I like. A little bit androgynous, bit of makeup, sort of slightly Bowieish vocals in places as well. Mm. Guy's got a little yelp in his voice, you know. They're they're very impressive. 
Yeah, I, I, I got all their records last year after I heard them. And then like a month or two later, I get a press release that they're recording a cleaner song. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. Well, MGMT have done one, as you know. Yeah, they did the same. Cover. They did the same song, yeah. yeah. Well, the results of that is with, um, I don't know. My, I've got a music publishing company. I mean, Johnny, you know, we're not going anywhere near any record companies. We, we don't have to. I mean, they batted. They didn't, I never tried to get involved in a record. I, I can't think of when I last sent any kind of a, well, it would have been a tape, I suppose, to a record company. It would have been about, I haven't actually approached anyone for a record deal in decades. They come to me. But very well. often I said, very often I just say, oh, no, you're all right. I can. I said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. We'll, we'll sell a few. Um, We'll sell a few cassettes or something, and they kind of don't believe me. It's like, yeah, you know, like I said. Oh, look, sorry, that's all email coming in. Um, I'm just batting it away. This, they're, um, they say, well, you know, what, what do you do with a bloke who doesn't won't take the money? You know, what, what, I just want to do music, you know, I'm, that, and I'm doing it, and I'm selling it. So, what do I need a record company for? It's like a shopping list that bands used to go, oh, yeah, well, that's right. Oh, yeah, publisher, yeah, agent, record company. I haven't got an agent because I don't do many gigs. I only, I only do them within cycling distance of my home, which can be up to 50 miles probably. But, but um, so I don't need an agent. I have got a music publisher. I've been with them for years. They're called Notting Hill Music. And they've got large parts of the old cleaners catalogue. But, you know, they look after me. And it's only a matter of time before one of them gets me a massive cover because I'm, I think I, they actually understand me now. I said, look, if I wrote a song for, 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 for Bette Midler, would you have the power to get it to her? They said, we would if you did it, because that's the kind of pub, that's what publishers used to do. Mm. But I mean, Bette Midler probably doesn't feel like going out and gigging much either. She's, you know, but I, I really, really like her. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's only a matter of time for some of the songs that Richard Shelton did, you know, like the. All right. Yeah, because he's in he's a, in Hollywood now, but he's being more of an actor than a singer, but which is, you know, I don't know I, I, sometimes you go and do your other thing. Like I went and do poetry or writing, but uh, he's 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 being in quite a lot of films. And I, I don't always know the American name, the, the American names of them, but he's 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 a property now. And he's got a really good agent. Nice. That was yeah. Grenadine and Blue. Was that one of his? Yeah, Grenadine and Blue. He did that. Yeah. He did a whole album uh, with about five, five or six of my songs on a yeah. few years ago. Top Cat. And then he went out to America. Um, yeah, I think it might have been. It was Top Cat. Yeah. And I still punt songs at him. And one day he's going to have a really biggie with her. Because if I, if I, there are certain songs that I just couldn't sing. He has this kind of proper singer's voice. So speaking of covers, um, I kind of wanted to focus on the Off White album because that's getting reissued. But you don't, you haven't recorded. I mean, I've seen you do a few covers live, like uh, Life on Mars, Matt Murray yeah. song. But uh, I do unusual covers. <laughs> what made you decide to record the Smith song? Some girls are bigger than others. <sighs> what did make me do that? I'm trying to think when it was. It was about. When did that come out? 1985 or six, wasn't it? Yeah, it would have been 86 that came out because I was working in a studio at the time. And, you know, I, I liked the Smiths a great deal. I don't know. I just got into the habit of occasionally busking it. When I was in France, I'd, I'd tune a guitar to a cleaner's tuning and see if I could play it. And I th it might have been Louis. Louis might have said, oh, we can put this. I said, what? Put a Smiths cover on my album. The Smiths was still a property then. I'm not sure if they'd quite broken up then when I did that album. When was that, 1995? They might have done, actually. Yeah, they had probably broken up. Yeah, they broke up in 87. Yeah. Um, but they were still very much at the forefront, so I thought, well, okay, well, as long as we just chuck it away, just me and an acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want... Because, you know, it'd been done as well as it could be. And not only that, but I do actually know what... Johnny Marr plays on that. 
and I could just about get it. But I didn't want to do what Johnny Marr was doing. You know, I just sort of, I did what, what would happen to that song if the cleaners had written it, okay. which they didn't. <laughs> Is that the only cover you've put on an album? Hmm. Uh, it might be. Yeah. It might well, be. It always stood out to me because of that. I do lots. I do lots of cover versions when I'm in pubs and busking or something like that, mm. or or just when I'm at a gig. I think it's funny to do. I I, I do a Matt Munro cover. Yes, I saw uh, that at the Golden Afternoon. Yeah, I do Matt Munro cover. I do quite unusual covers of things. You know, I choose songs that you wouldn't necessarily strum with a guitar. And um, but I've I've got enough songs of my own. I don't have to do covers if I don't want to. Yeah, I, I don't. If if I like a song that much, uh, uh, and I think the song is so perfect, I, I very often I don't think there's anything I can bring to it that the artist and the writer and the producers haven't already done. I'd just rather leave it where it is, you know, not disinter it, not disturb it, not disturb a sacred site. It's okay for me to throw it away live, but I don't think I ought to go and say, oh, by the way, I could, you know, have done that. I've got too many songs of my own. It's, it's like John Cooper Clark said to me, have you ever thought of writing a writer? You never write any fiction, do you, Martin? And I, I, I said, um, no, I said, <laughs> he said, this was really funny, like a New Yorker kind of saying, no, there's way too much interesting stuff going on in the world without me making shit up. <laughs> but that's, that's, what, that's why I do think that. There's way too much interesting stuff going on in actual life without me making stuff up. <laughs> I, I don't read many novels either. I, well, I'll put it this way. I, I generally, I'm still working my way through the 19th century. And a bit of the twentieth century. What are some of your favorite novels? I, we've talked about Don Levy before, who I'm a big fan of. Uh, yeah, novels. Well, I, I do sort of like um, George Orwell a lot. That constantly comes back, but very often then his essays and his letters more more than. An, but uh, and one of the books that sort of changed me a bit was. Uh, Reading 1984. I read that when I was 19. I can't think. I'd have to look and see what the what novels I read. I don't often read them. Okay. Or I have read them. I mean, in the past. Uh, oh, I mean, I like. There's an American writer called uh, Washington Irving, that I really like. But I, I can't say I've read a novel by. But I've he. I've written lots of, read lots of short stories by him. There's a sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon, if you ever come across that. Oh, I don't know that. Well, it's, it's a book of his short stories. He traveled in England a lot. Okay. I think he was partly of English ancestry. So he, and that would have been a perilous undertaking in the early 19th century. You know, it had been a long sailing trip to England. Hmm. And he traveled extensively. And he is a really bright guy. You know, I, I love reading his stuff. He wrote Rip Van Winkle. Yes. And people who don't know that story uh, or, or they've just heard of it, they think it's about this guy who went to sleep for 100 years. He didn't. He went to sleep for 20 years. And it was kind of, um, it's an allegory, really. I, I, he he goes to sleep. And when he wake, when he when he goes to sleep, there's a, George the third is on the is on the on the inside. Twenty years later, he wakes up and the place is a bustling town rather than a sleepy backwater. And and George Washington is on the inside. And there's quite a bit of mysticism in it as well. Okay. I think it's the Catskill Mountains. He he kind of wakes up. He he sees these like not dwarfs exactly, but these small men, and they're having a bowl, a thunderous bowling match in the, in the Catskills. And uh, they're drinking some sort of liquor. And why they do this? And he thinks they're the ghosts of, um, I don't know, a Dutch navigator, of, of some, you know, because the Dutch had, had New York and all that area long before the British did. In fact, New York was called New Amsterdam, wasn't it, at one point? Yep. <laughs> yeah. And so 
they think it's an a, a, they think he's like he he must be in the early nineteenth late eighteenth century. It would be the late eighteenth century when Americans had independence, wasn't it? it was seventeen ninety three, about the same time as the French one. Seventy six. <laughs> seventy six. Oh, it's earlier. Sorry, I I can't know everything about everything, can I? But that's not bad for a limey, is it? Who's never studied it? <laughs> so, um, so he's seeing the ghosts from maybe. 100 years earlier from the from the 17th century they're wearing galley gaskins and those dutch kind of crowned hats uh, and uh, he wakes up from this and goes down to the village where his his wife is dead and every you know everyone's dead <laughs> a few people remember him that's all a lot happens in 20 years mm. it's a, it's a, it's got a a little bit of the occult about it and mysticism which is why I turned it into a children's opera briefly because with Colin Towns, Colin Towns played with Gillen's band. But um, I think instead of spending his pop star money on what pop stars usually spend their money on, there was a graph in there's a pie graph. I'm sorry, big houses, expensive chicks, drugs, uh, rehab, you know, and this, but very seldom do big rock stars or in big bands of that ilk spend their money sensibly but i think he he had him he taught himself arrangements and gradually got an orchestra and set up a studio and, and, and went into jazz uh and you know he's quite he, he and he started doing film music so some quite famous series and films i didn't know you turned it into a children's opera yes well because colin approached me because we had we shared the woman who ran his office was also managing my poetry career on the side. And she said, Martin, um, Colin has been commissioned to do the West 11 children's opera. Uh, do you fancy doing the libretto for it? And I said, yeah, I could have a go at it. And I said, is there a story? I said, no. And then at that time, uh, I think it was Lily's mum, my daughter's mother said, have you ever read Rip Van Winkle? And I said, no. And she passed me this children's book and it had, it had a, this Washington Irving story, which is how I discovered him. And there's um, this story about Rip Van Winkle. And it was beautifully written. His children ran wild as if they belonged to nobody. You know, he was quite a lazy man. His wife was understandably some something of a term again because you had to hold the whole place together. That he was this guy, the kids loved him, but he was sort of good for nothing. You know, he, when, when, when he wanted to get away from the shouting and the yelling, he'd go up with his old dog and his musket into the, into the cat skills for days. So he was kind of early hippie, I guess, of sorts. And, and I thought this would be a good subject. And when I got challenged by the quite, it has to be said, middle class society who oversaw this, this opera, they said, well, what's, I said, well, it's just a rattling good story. It's a short story by Washington Irving. But I said, well, why, why do you think it's relevant to now? And I'm thinking, these people. Okay, I said, look, it's a, it's, it's, I, I think it remains allegorical. It's like the difference between England in the 60s and England in the 1980s. You know, when you've got... Uh, or, or, or England in the 1980s and England now. When you, it's the difference between Thatcher and Blair. You've got two separate regimes, but in, in our case, I thought it was England was this kind of England swings and all the rest of it, and nice old Mr. Wilson. Then suddenly, 1977, and in comes Thatcher with a new broom sweeping everything in front of him, laying off people and <laughs> just, just being, you know, fairly fairly challenging really to people who, who just had a bohemian sort of 60s and early 70s or grown up in that suddenly there was somebody cracking a whip and marching around saying money is good the same thing happens in america you know it's gordon gecko stuff so i thought that would be a good kind of um comparison to draw and anyway they took that so i wrote this opera and we got it done and they, so they performed it four times and it was jolly good and Colin wrote some great music for it and the lyrics were good and it only that's what happens to operas it nearly 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 went to the Royal Opera House the Royal Opera House expressed an interest but I think what happened was the people the parents and all the people who run this very good 
West 11 children's office, all from the hands. All the way, you know, they got, you know, they kind of, um, they got very overheated and excited about it. And I think the thing just kind of vaporized in a, in a, in a pile of steam really. But that would have been nice to say I'd had something on at the Royal Opera House because I, I don't like opera very much, <laughs> which is why I thought I should maybe write one because I could probably do a better job of it. I'm like that. <laughs> Speaking of the 60s, I want to ask you, I've, I've been on a big kinks kick lately. I've watched a couple of documentaries on YouTube. Ah, uh, the kinks, yeah. What are your thoughts on the kinks? Well, I, I liked them. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I wasn't as influenced by them or I don't think I was. Um, as you might think, the Who were the people who influenced me. They wrote about English things, Pete Townsend and the Beatles, the Who and the Beatles between them made me think, and the small faces made me think that you should do kind of Englishy things. I mean, I, I didn't, like I'm constantly telling people, I didn't live in the deep south and, and pick cotton and my woman didn't done left me or nothing like that. I didn't sit on a porch with a, you know, strumming a guitar. None of that happened to me. I lived in an English suburban street and I thought that's what I should write about. And Pete Townsend did it to a certain extent and the Beatles did with Penny Lane. It was kind of location, you know, uh, you know, familiar things. And I wa right from a very early age, I wanted to do that. And it wasn't until really later I thought, oh yeah, the Kinks do that. Yeah. I do remember them being part of the soundtrack. But they weren't my, my main guys, but I did. I, I was always had a great affection for them. I can't say they were an influence, not initially. Or since. I just think that I'm mining the same vein as them, you know, the same very rich seam of of English experience and the standard, almost cliched poetic dilemma or artistic dilemma of where you you see that the the country and the background you grow up in is, is disappearing as you get older. It's changing all the time and you rush around frantically taking Polaroids of it to, uh, to um, that dates me, doesn't it, Polaroids? Okay, it's instant snaps to, to kind of preserve it. And, and my sketches just happened to be pop songs because that was all I knew how to do at the time. I was listening to a lot of Slade yesterday. Were you a, you a Slade fan? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I love even... Bloody Slade. I thought they were great. They were just so good. Such a great, happy, cheerful bunch of bastards. Yeah. Really. It's yeah, anything fun. with Slade on, I'll watch because they're such good value. And, uh, and Noddy Holder and Jim Lee, who were Wolverhampton, Walsall lads, that's black country as they call it. They're very clever boys. You know, they, they weren't, they, they they had this kind of glam rock yobbish exterior, but they, they were they were pretty artistic. You listen to their stuff; it's very clever, yeah, really clever. Yeah, it's well put together, and it rocks. It rocks like a bastard. It really does. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about the Off White album that's going to be released. Yeah, the Off White album. Go on. Let's not let's weeks. not convolute too much. Um, yes, it, it is out soon. Yeah. Just tell me like where you were at going into making it. You've just had a big success with The Greatest Living Englishman. Um, I didn't see it as a big success because I lived in England. And although I went out to Japan, it was it all took time. You know, I was making it in 1993. Uh, the Greatest Living Englishman. It came out at the end of 1983, October. Uh, the English reviewers, it has to be said, were their usual sniffy selves. They knew that I was from a band called The Cleaners from Venus. One or two of them knew that I'd, met, I'd written some quality pop songs. But the fact of the matter is I've never been a London guy. And if you're not hanging around drinking in the bars and hanging out with these people and nobody knows you, if you're not in a gang, you're not one of them. And nobody ever says that, but it is nonetheless true because it's not just me. It happens uh, there's other people who just, to an extent, they were like that about XTC because XTC were, were, were Swindon boys. Mm. And I think Slade to an extent. People in the London Cognoscenti, mind you, London's going down a pan now because there's no grassroots venues anymore. And, and it's just got too middle class for its own good, really. But um, 
people who don't live in London, they don't, they, they, if they don't, if they go home every night, like the move used to, the move were right in the middle of swinging London, making great pop records. They just used to drive home to Birmingham every night. And, and I think the same with um, Terry Chambers of Vex TC said, you know, once he's got over that hill and saw Swindon, you know, in the, in the dip there, he thought he felt better, you know, he, he, cause he liked the place. Like I like Colchester and, and Wivenhoe and you don't want to hang around with a bunch of knobs really, do you? So I just don't hang around with the fuckers. And, and uh, sorry, I'm using bad language, aren't I? But, but they, they are sniffy with me. So I wasn't going back to the great Stephen Englishman. I, I wasn't really allowed to feel I'd had a success. I mean, there was one sniffy thing in one of the glossies saying, oh, and uh, this Martin Newell, who, who had this kind of nowhere bank on the Queen's Bridge, said, unexpectedly seems to be selling quite a lot of records in America. I'll tell you another example of that. John Waite. Do you know that name? I ain't missing you, a single oh, from the oh, 80s. Yeah, yeah. I ain't missing you since you've been gone. It was number one for like about two months in America or something like that. Yeah. He belonged to a band called, I think they were called The Babies, maybe, or Mighty, but I can't remember. But he was in a band that didn't really take off in England. And when he got that number one, the headline, or the, there was a sidebar on one of the tabloids, uh, the tabloids and it said Mr. Nobody is number one in America I mean what kind of fucking bastards is that you know they can't even support their home team who's gone out and scored a victory in big important America they can't even support that so I wasn't expecting a miracle so and when I talked to Andy Parch I said what do I do next we knew we'd made this this really good album and he said very sagely get on with the next one have something to give them when they ask. And that's what I did. And so pretty soon, uh, you know, at the end of 1993, I was already writing for the off White album. And we got delayed because that album should have come out in 1994. The story of the off White album is always of delay. I don't know why this happens in the music industry, it, but it wasn't a difficult second album or anything. And that, that's why I ended, it was Kevin Crace's idea to get Louis. And I thought that would be nice because I like French music. We'll get a, a Frenchman's overview uh, of, of this. And of course, we got the, the strings, yeah. uh, which were great. And um, the, the, you know, the, 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 the vocal being prominent above the mix, you know, not, not being buried like under a load of indie guitars, but you know, being really like a chansonnier, like Leo Ferre or something. You see him, if you look at that in your, in your mind, you can see there's the orchestra and then the singer, the narrator, comes to the front of the stage and begins to tell you the story. And, that, and the Off-White album is a kind of a, almost like an English chansonnier album. Predictably, the French liked it a great deal. And oddly enough, I got a very good review in no less organ than Liberation. Oh. And the reviewer was Nick Kent, Oh, wow. who doesn't speak very good French, apparently, even though he is married to a French woman who, who is a TV presenter because she interviewed me once. I'd never met Nick, but he gave the Off-White album such a great review. I had to have it translated because my French ain't good either. But, but I mean, it's OK. I could probably have struggled through it, but it was much easier passing it to a French person and saying, what does this say? And uh, he said, <laughs> the English, eh? what can you do with them? And um Basically, it said, you know, forget Blur and Oasis. If you want to hear English, you should listen to this guy. Nice. <laughs> yeah, which was great. That was the gist of it. He liked it. He really liked it. And from Nick Kent, that's, uh, that's no small thing, because he was actually a really good rock writer. He came from that classic NME of the 1970s, where there were some genuinely great rock journalists around, people like Charles Shaw Murray, people who just loved the stuff, knew the stuff hung out with the bands, occasionally lived a lifestyle, but, you know, they were fair enough. Fair enough, all of them. No, not all of them, but most of them. You and Louis Philippe worked quite well together. I, you both seem to enjoy making that record. From We did. Uh, it was a shame it was mired in a bit of, there was a bit of cash flow problems. You know, it's, that's what happens sometimes with an indie label. It's not always the indie label's fault. But 
there comes a point where an indie label is either going up or they're they're struggling around, and sometimes at the end of the week they don't always have the money. Hmm. And so we're thinking, God, I hope we're going to get this finished. I mean, it's no worse than happened to the zombies when they were making Odyssey and Oracle. I think Rod Argent and the boys had to put their hands in their pockets to finish that album with their own, their own cash. Such was such was their record company's you know, lack of support for them at the time. That's what I understood. They, they, you know, they were in Abbey Road, but there wasn't quite the money to finish that album. And it's just, just one of the great albums, isn't it? Hmm. You know, it crosses all borders. I mean, it's very soft and pastoral English, and yet Captain Sensible likes it. I think Paul Weller it is, who I think it's his favourite album. <sighs> yeah. Um, so the Off-White album, I was writing for that all the way through, and I was writing on the road. And then, of course, we had to promote the record. So we went to France, and we went to, uh, I think we were in Germany. Then we went. To, I went to Japan with Captain and Kevin in June. And then um, that was 94. And then and then I came back. And went to Iceland with the Icelandic cultural attaché, who briefly became the ambassador for a while because he was a, a jazz musician who was really liked my poetry. And then I'd no sooner got back from there with raging toothache when I, I made a, a pilot for a film. Uh, and, and when I'd done that, I suddenly I looked at the watch and it was like time to go to Japan again. And, and that's what happened to me. And so I was doing all this and that was 1994. It just went in a blur. Uh, and, and so all, all this stuff was going on. But then we didn't get the album out in 1995. I can't remember why, but I think Humbug got taken over and it finally came out in early 96. I can't actually remember. I was doing lots of poetry. And 95, uh, I think I was going to be a father. I thought, I've got to make some money. So I went out to Germany, kind of touring just by myself for a bit, which was, which was lonely and very knackering. You know, because Germany, I love Germany, love the Germans, love the beer. You know, so what am I doing? I'm out on my own, lonely in Germany, playing gigs, having a big fuss made of me, then going back to my lonely hotel room and just think, ha, ah, beer, because that's what happens to you. Mm. And and it really does. And that's why I don't like to. And see, yeah, but more people should say no to it. And I think they'll have to now because it seems, it's always seemed very ungreen. You know, people battering on about saving the planet and take three up. Arctic chucks worth of gear and, and go to a massive great tour. I mean, how much of a carbon footprint does a Rolling Stones tour leave? You know, why not? And we've got all the technology not to have to do that. Stars should stay in their own areas and be big there, really. Saving, you know, just, I wouldn't mind that. Mm. Have them but come to you. <laughs> it's not a normal thing to do, especially not for kind of really touring. You should read that like the army. Men, men are old when they are 32 in the army. Their regards as getting a bit senior because you're your peak eight between 18 and 32. That's when you can go out and storm the world when you're a rock and roller. But, you know, you get up to about 40 and you start needing a bit, a bit more sleep. And the people who say they don't usually die young. <laughs> or they bolster themselves with silly, you know, the devil's dandruff, silly sherbet. <laughs> And I, I've never done that. I've, I've never sort of thought much of that. But I, I, I'm a demon for the drink. As soon as I, as soon as I'm in a tour situation, it's like, where's, where's the, where's the fridge? You know, where's the beer? Yeah. Then you get a veranda over the toy shop as well. So you don't want that. <laughs> Too much beer. <laughs> Balcony over the playroom, as the Aussies call it. So let's talk about the tunes. Uh, Call me Michael Moonlight, the opening track. Um, that was about uh, it was about madness. I spent an awful lot of time in train stations and bus stations when I was making a great of an Englishman. And Bath, as like Rivenhoe, like all healing places with Regency buildings, has more than its fair share of of people who've been mentally ill. I met um, a, a woman who I surmised at some point had been a lawyer, and she'd just burned out, and she was. 
she was mentally ill and she was talking to me in the, in the bus station in Bath and I just stayed and listened to her. That was one of her phrases. Ah. I, that, I, I gleaned between all this rubbish she was talking and she wasn't drunk. She just said, well, that's what it was like when I was in Chambers. Yeah, I mean, it was just a case of call me Michael Moonlight. And I thought, fucking hell. And that lodged in there. First two things. First, that she was bonkers, mad. And secondly, that it was a great song title. <laughs> but I didn't write it down. It just wouldn't go away. Mm. It was a bit shocking, really, when you're confronted with stark madness. You know, it's, 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 you know, someone who's really got a disordered brain. That's terrible, that. And she was just sitting in a bus station. She was well-spoken. She was bright. She was bonkers. Mm. Yeah. I've, I, so I stayed to talk to her. Hmm. And that was one song, yeah. <laughs> We've done the Smiths one. Uh, the World of uh, Dandy Lee. World of Dandy Lee was actually just my take on the music industry. Penny for you, shilling for me. This was the world of Dandy Lee. Mm. You know, I'll make you a star. I'll do this. I'll do that. Uh, people thought it w was... Um, uh, so I'll just get rid of that. Uh, people thought it was some kind of... Um, that I'd done it about a person, but it was no one person. Okay. It was just the music industry. I realised once I was writing it, that it was just the music industry as a whole. It was a composite character of, of, the, of the music industry. Mm. You know, this, I'll do this for you. I'll do that for you. I'll make you a star. And when you are broken, going insane, Dandy will sing once again, penny for you, shilling for me. Probably, I don't know if it sounds bitter or not, but I was cross at the time because I realised... Uh, when I wrote it, well, how old I, would I have been? 40? No, I was younger. I was in my late, I was in my mid 30s when I wrote it. I realized that I spent all this time working and stuff. And the one thing I hadn't really done was make a lot of money from it. Mm. I've made good records. I've done good work. It's amazing also how uh, critical respect in England will 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 take you quite a long way. I don't know why, probably because the people who, who are the critics are middle class and overeducated. Um but money will will probably do more. They'll dislike you, but they'll have to torture you. Uh I think I I don't I, don't, I just wanted to do this job. I've been at it long enough now to know that I like music and I, I retain my huge enthusiasm for it. And I now seem to be getting paid for it as well. And uh, getting the royalties from songs I wrote years ago because I couldn't sell them at the time. That's never going to get anywhere. Now there are things really kind of, I'm being admired as an artist. And I said, well, well that's very good. But, you know, where were you 30, 40 years ago? You know, no one was calling me a fucking genius then. So why should anything change now? So I'm not, I'm not going to the, I won't go to, you know, it's no, no one's going to any parties, but there are a list of things that I won't go to or won't accept, even if they came to me. Nobody's asking me at the moment. The BBC don't really play my records or very infrequently. Uh, I think probably as a result of some of the things I've said, I'm fairly outspoken. That I that they think oh we better not go near him I think they probably regard me as a, a snarling spitting yobbo but uh, there's nothing that the establishment hates more than an intelligent articulate yob mm. they like to be able to pat you on the head if you're stupid or welcome you back into the fold if you've come from a basically middle class background but I am neither. And, um, you know, I mean, one of these things I know, you know, there's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's great, isn't it? That's a good idea. That's something I'd never get involved in. Why? Because I thought you left school and you'd left with no qualifications and you became a pop star. And then, you know, you took a bit of this and took a bit of that and got in a couple of fights and just generally behaved like a complete scumbag for a bit until you got 
got the wisdom and became rather more polite and became a gentleman, which is what happened. Um, and you, but you don't go and put on when the businessmen who've made the money out of you decide to run an award scheme that you then put on their uniform, which is the black monkey suit and the, and the bow tie and go and sit down for dinner with them and have them say you've done very well. I'm not interested in those people. I wasn't interested in them then. And I regard the bow tie as, as a kind of um, a sartorial swastika. And I will never wear one. It's the, it's the uniform of the enemy, as far as I'm concerned. I'm not sitting down with the fuckers. Not even if they wanted me to. So I, I don't think that, um, you know, getting into the... Rock, I mean, you see people saying, why hasn't so-and-so been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? You know, who'd want that? Standing there like a fucking wazzit, you know, with a bow tie and all a monkey suit on and going, oh, thank you, I'm so grateful. I'm so, I don't believe you've invited me in here. Best thing, just don't go. You know, like Peter Cook once said, I think, you know, the police Cook, the English satirist, who was invited somewhere and said, way up in, a, in the front, he looked in his diary and he said, unfortunately, I find I'm watching television that evening. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so funny. And the other, the other classic one, the only cartoon he did, where someone comes up and she says, I'm writing a novel. And he said, yes, neither am I. <laughs> 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 I love Peter Cook. Yeah. Yeah, just such a funny geezer. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, oh. that's that's that. But the rest of the album, no, I, ju I just like doing what I'm doing. I love making music and recording stuff. So that's what I do. It's not too much to it. Up next in the track order is Arcadian Boys, which sort of has a light jazz feel that you kind of explored more on the records after this okay boys it was done like a kind of bit, something from an opera louis had just me and a string quartet you know mm. just me and the london Symph symphony orchestra <laughs> 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 i was going to call it lick my love pump but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but but nigel nigel tufnell had already got that title <laughs> so um yeah that was that was a, a kind of a poem really it was actually a sort of a poem, Arcadian Boys. And Louis put that very fancy string quartet on it worked. But there's an earlier version of it as well, with all echoey guitars, cleaners version of it. Have you ever heard that? I must have. Yeah. 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 So that, that's very different. But um, oddly enough, people seem to like that one. And so James, the film director, is coming up here in a week or two to film me playing it. And I've suddenly realized it's probably a little bit too high for me now. Yeah. So um, can I reach the piano? So I'd probably do it in this. Boy, do it a key down. Arcadian boys. So I do it in F and B flat and see, see how that works out. Just kind of busk it. It's, it's only kind of two or three chords in it. But the lyrics are very arty and oblique, not norm normal sort of thing I write, you know. Yeah. I mean, I can write it, but it's, you know, ordinary people saying, what's that about? <laughs> and I like ordinary people to understand what I'm doing. You know, they give you, the critics give you points for being difficult. They can stroke their stupid beards. And go, oh, yes, yes, very profound. Nobody knows what he was driving at there. Was it the human condition or had he somehow captured an earlier zeitgeist? I think, you know, I just couldn't think what to write, so I'll put that in. <laughs> uh, when the Danzens are down, seems the most greatest living Englishman song on the record to me. Yeah, the Danzens down is like... Um, when I used to go and stay with my, my grandparents or I lived with them sometimes when, when my dad, who was in the army, was in England, was in was in the Far East. And in autumn, there was this thing where we tidied up the garden and it was a damson tree down the bottom. It's a very narrow strip of a terraced house, but it had a couple of trees in it. And uh, you knew kind of when the damsons were down. And you, you had that bon the autumn bonfire that, 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 you know, the summer was gone now, you know. Okay. So it mentions the Constable Skies and all the rest of it. And it was still close enough to me having been recently a gardener, doing a gardening job. Mm. 
So that's, a, you know, really, yeah, poems about England in the autumn. Okay. Sort of thing that people like me do. Miss Van Houten's <laughs> Coffee Shop. Great pop yeah. song. Someone asked me if that was about Lions, Lions Coffee House, but which was a big coffee, a chain coffee shop in England back in the 50s, you know. The sort of thing you see in Brief Encounter where people in wartime uniforms and said, are you happy, darling? I remember once when I was terribly unhappy, shortly after Johnny had been killed, when his Spitfire was shot down. Was, they said it would have been instant, that sort of thing, you know. And, and um, it, it wasn't actually, it was about me going to cafes in the late 60s, you know, when I was about 14 or 15 and kind of um, looking at a, an old waitress of all of 19 or 20 when I was 14 or 15 thinking, oh God, I really love her. You know, that sort of thing, you know. Yeah, so it was kind of like that, really. It wasn't about a Dutch coffee shop or dope or anything like that. It was, it was just about you know, and using those words of I, you know, it couldn't care less to cheer or she would break my heart for cheer, all that you know, just mucking about. There's lots of names in the titles on this record. You got Ursula, Phyllis, Miss Van. Hull, yeah, that's Michael. right. Yeah, there are. I do use a lot of names. I put I either put situations or or give people. Or types of people, names. Yeah, I'm, I've got to get out of that habit. There's a there's a few on the new album as well. I was like, I'm trying to iron that. Yeah, well, uh, Phyllis of Colchester was just this horrible woman who was, I would say, pretty common, really. Going out with a bruiser, draped in gold, orange suntan from a holiday in Spain, but would look on somebody like me and Nell when we were busking in a precinct, which we were licensed to do. We were actually licensed by the council to busk. Um, just looking at us like we were trash with her glittery eyes. Like that, you know, in a way that, you know, dragging on a cigarette, just looking at us like, you know, you're trash. And she kind of didn't get the point of that. No, and, and so I just wrote this very excoriating description of her described her lips as being like a stab wound in heat and all the rest of it. And her jewellery rattling like a busload of androids going home. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty nasty songwriting, really. My two favourites, actually two of my favourite songs of yours in, as a whole are the last two on the record, uh, Good Night Country Girl and The Girls in the Flat Upstairs. Yeah, that's come out quite well. The girls in the flat upstairs. I listen. That comes in. It it comes in with that sweep of strings, yeah. and and it really sounds like it means business. This sounds like a big, big record. It sounds like a classic. Perhaps when I'm dead, it will be or something. But I can't see them recognizing me now. No, oh, there's nothing here for me now. <laughs> no, I can't. I can't uh, see. I can't see myself really being acknowledged in England. So I just get on with what I do, you know, and I don't want to come out touring. So they'll have to wait once it's till after I'm dead. Did you record Goodnight Country Girl in the woods? Yes, we did. Yeah, we recorded as a picture of it. That's that was that was an idea. I was very up for it. I said we, we should be recorded outside. So we me and Joe and Louie and my dog and we went out and we we, we lit this we very cold, clean, early winter day and just lit a little fire, you know, just so we could warm our hands on it. She shouldn't really do in the woods, but it was in a big clearing. So, yeah. uh, you know, and I know how to keep it. So we got the fire going and the dog was there and recorded it on a mandolin with Louis with a handheld recorder. Wow. And we put a little bit on it when we went in the studio, a little bit of backing vocals. I think Tiff did the, the deep voice. Yeah. It was me, that and Home County's Boy. That was that was the the acoustic down home country track for that particular album. Okay. It wasn't on a shopping list. Oh, we better get one of those. But you know, we didn't try to do it. We didn't try to do the greatest living Englishman again. There was no point. It was a very good album. I'm glad I did it. I had so much fun with Andy Partridge doing it. Um, but all it served to do was to prove that I could 
make a, a what do they call it an album with conventional values if i wanted to but even so there are still certain american and uh, british hi-fi mags where the person who's writing it will, will say knowledge me of course you can see that they didn't have it truly high fidelity because there were so and so giveaway signs and the kind of patches they've used on the synthesizer and you because they've availed themselves of the knowledge you know of how it was made so they could say that it because otherwise they feel cheated you know such people worship the gear more than they do the the art which is made on it so they'll feel sort of cheated if you've gone into a shed and whacked out something that's actually pretty good mm. they'll they'll pick holes in the in the technological aspects of it but in an age where technology has widely superseded the art form i think that's a very foolish thing to do you can see what's happened when you've got when the technology's progress has outstripped the art form you've j you just get a bunch of well basically people putting down a drum beat and and chanting a nursery rhyme over it because the old ar arcane art of songwriting such as learn a low might have dashed off in an afternoon has disappeared hmm. i'm still studying it myself still studying how songs are written but increasingly i have to go into the past to find them i find very little yeah you know, sting and elvis costello can manage a song they're, they're good they're both really good sting especially it's fantastic he's a master and he gets sort of just a bit dismissed in England, really, by the critics. Oh, there he goes. There's Sting being all successful and everything. But that's what they like about him. You know, he's a, like a a milkman's son from Geordie Land. He's come from quite a humble background, and he's a top-notch songwriter and composer. He knows his shit. He's one of those people who said that if if someone said, "Well, would you, you know, would you fancy Sting producing your album?" I'd say, "Yeah, yeah, I, I would accept that because he would know." He would know what I wanted, what I meant. And uh, Elvis Costello, I, I don't find quite as likable, but I, you can see that he really, he's a huge fan of that art form known as a song. Bloody good. And he's married to Diana Krall as well. Because she is no mean feat. She is no, she is a, a, a you know, really good musician. She's one of those people, I think, Oh, I'll put some Diana Krall on. She's a bit good. I'll never be able to play a piano as well as her. Yeah, there's a few songwriters like that. Uh, but there aren't as many as perhaps there should be. Hmm. And then people are surprised that they make so much money. Because they make money because they can do this magic called songwriting. And I can do it a little bit as well. I might just see who that is. Oh, do you mind if I answer this? Yeah, I'll pause it. <laughs> okay. All right, we're back. Um, Can you hear me? Yeah, so we've covered yeah pretty much all the songs. Hey, any thoughts on the album as a whole? What, the off White album? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've come to look at it. You know, I do a lot of stuff, and I hadn't really thought about it a lot. And it, and, and it came out late, and it coincided with quite a difficult time in my life when it came out. 1996, when it came out, wasn't a particularly auspicious year for me. It was a kind of a, a, a year when I had to struggle and sort things out and write things. And it, it was a, a couple of years where I was falling between the stools, two stools of music and poetry and trying to juggle both. And then 1907, it started to break again. And all the time, Britpop was the undercurrent of this. And there was this very much this feeling like, hey, I should be doing this stuff, or at least. Uh, but uh, 96, I was just kind of working and had this infant daughter as well, which I was thinking, how are we going to sort that one out? You know, get the money and rent and all the rest of it. And I did it. But I took some unusual jobs, uh, you know, music and poetry jobs and residencies and trips to strange places. So the Off White album is, was associated with that. So for ages, I didn't listen to it. It's only recently I've started to look at it and thought, some of this is pretty good. <laughs> but um, I would probably, in retrospect, have bunged more echo on the vocals, that's all. But then that's just me being Mr. Lo-Fi. 
the whole idea of getting Louis in was I didn't make the vocals sound cheap or like somebody was on drugs, but you know, and, and Louis wasn't, he was very straight laced about it. No, just, and he just he, he magic up a string quartet. And I said, well, how are we going to tell him what to play? He said, I will write the arrangements. And he just would do that. And I was thinking, well, that's pretty, <laughs> hey, that's rocket science. <laughs> but I'm learning that myself now, but I don't read music like he does. Um, so I'm, you know, you'll find that I've just got this string composer thing now that I use. It's pretty amazing, but I have to learn how the strings are arranged now, so I'm learning. Could be strings on the new record? Yeah, Strings-ish. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, before I was using a DX27, you know? And the DX27 was has things that are like 19... Yeah, nine, 1985, did it come out? 1985's version of what strings on a on a cheap synthesizer would sound like. When the DX27 was the budget version of the DX7, and it did have a thing that said cellos and violins, and they nearly, they sound cello-ish in places and violin-ish in places. And I thought, well, you know, I'll just use them. But then I became very interested in how they worked. So I've got a new gizmo now, a Kurtz file. Um, it's, it's a portable arranger, they call it. It's got the most extraordinary sounds. And I'm not doing product placement here, but, you know, it, it's amazing. I thought... I'm, I'm going to see what happens when I just use these things. I, mean, I don't care. What, why would I care what anyone thinks? If it sounds good, it's okay, you know. Yeah. So I'm not going to bother what, about what musicians or critics think. I'm just using it. So it's, yeah, I'm using that. I've even done something that only had orchestral instruments in. And I'm going to bung that on the album as well. It's a little sketch of a national anthem. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It sounds, sounds like a bit of Elgar or something. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Well, I know you got to get going. So, um, anything else you want to add about anything else you're doing? No, but watch out for the next album. That could probably come out in about June, I should think. So, no particular fanfare because we'll just release it on Bandcamp. And, and uh, but they do start to sell now. Great. Well, thanks very much, Martin. Yeah. It's, well, it's nice to talk to you anyway. Well, nice to rant at you. <laughs>